Hello, my dear students. I hope everything is fine with you. In the first lecture of public finance, I'll start by a quick review on chapter one. Chapter one, individuals and government. We started with individuals, society and government. Shedding a light on the importance of government existence in our daily life by asking you questions of what would it be like to live in a nation without government? There would be no system for everything, no courts, no national defense, no social security programs, no subsidized schools, no subsidized healthcare services, no infrastructure. That's why we focus on the existence of government importance in our daily life as governments are organizations formed to exercise authority over the actions of people who live together in a society and to provide and finance essential services such as justice, national defense, land security, subsidized schools, subsidized healthcare system. All these services can be only provided through the governments. That's why we are going to study public finance as it, it is the field of economics that studies government activities and the alternative means of financing government expenditures. As you study public finance, you will learn about the economic basis of government activities. Government can perform all of its function through political institutions which constitute the rules and generally accepted procedures that evolve in a community for determining what government does and how government outlays are financed. That we turn it to the allocation of resources between government and private use. Governments are used to provide citizens with goods and services such as roads, police and fire protection, national defense, as we mentioned before. These government goods and services are shared by all citizens. We can't, no citizens can use it exclusively. Other goods and services may provide it by a government for a limited availability to certain groups, such as aged group or children. That's why all the time we have a trade-off between government and the private goods and services. We can illustrate these trade-off between government and the private goods and services through using PB curve. PB curve shows the alternative combinations of government goods and services and the private goods and services that can be produced in an economy, given its productive resources and technology and assuming that resources are fully employed. We can say that private goods and services are those items such as food, clothing. They are usually made available for sale in markets. They are usually priced for a certain price. While government goods and services such as roads, schooling and fire protection usually are not sold in markets or if it priced their price does not reflect the actual cost for providing these services. So after allocation of resources between government use and private use, we turn it to how government goods and services are distributed. As mentioned before, government goods and services are distributed to groups of individuals through the use of non-market rationing. This means that government goods and services are not made available to persons according to their willingness to pay and their use is not rationed by prices. Then we turn it to the mixed economy, markets and politics. Starting with differentiating between pure economy and mixed economy. As we mentioned before, pure economy are an economy in which all goods and services would be supplied by private firms only. 
all exchanges of goods and services would take place through markets, with prices determined by free interaction between supply and demand. In a pure economy, there is no government intervention. While in a mixed economy, there is a government intervention, as mixed economy is one in which government supplies a considerable amount of goods and services and regulates private economic activities. So, governments usually regulate private economic activities and use taxes and subsidies to affect incentives to use resources within mixed economy. We explain the interaction of government and the private sector through the circular flow in the mixed economy. In the circular flow in the mixed economy, we started with representing input markets at the lower loop of the diagram of circular flow, where households sell the resources to firms for market determined prices, while output market is located in the upper loop, where the output is offered for sale to households, which in turn pay for them with the dollars earned from the sale of their members' productive resources. So, the distribution of income depends on the distribution of ownership of productive resources and the prices and other financial returns that resource owners receive from employment of those resources in production. We started with pure market economy in which there is no government intervention, where all goods and services would be produced by private sector only. While in a mixed economy, government would participate in markets as a buyers of goods and services, also as a buyer of inputs for, from household and acquire ownership right of such productive resources as land and capital. Governments use these inputs to provide goods and services that aren't sold to households and businesses firms but are made available through non-market rationing. However, governments do sometimes own and operate enterprises such as railroads services. So, Governments also purchase output of business firms such as papers, cars, and guns. To pay for them, the government requires businesses and households to make various payments such as taxes and fees and might even require resources be made available for use by the government at rates of compensation low actual markets. Government then uses these productive resources which are acquired to produce goods and services including national defense, roads, schools, police and fire protection. The central loop transactions are made through political institution whereas the upper and lower loop transactions of circular flow are made through market institutions. And was a quick review on what we took on chapter one. Chapter two, efficiency, markets, and government. We started chapter two by differentiating between positive and normative economics. Then we stated that efficiency is a normative criteria, which is satisfied when resources are used in such a way as to make it impossible to increase the well-being of one person without reducing the well-being of another one. That's why we concluded that the marginal conditions for efficient resource allocation requires that marginal social benefit of a product must equal its marginal social cost. Now, Let's examine the working of a system of perfectly competitive markets, in which an efficient economic system allocates resources so as to set the marginal social benefit of each good or service equal to its marginal social cost. So, the marginal conditions for efficient resource allocation is satisfied. 
perfectly competitive markets are organized for the purpose of allowing mutually gainful trades between buyers and sellers. A system of perfectly competitive markets can result in efficient resource use in an economy. So the question now is, where perfectly competitive market system exists? Perfectly competitive market system exists if all productive resources are privately owned, all transactions take place in markets, no buyers or sellers alone can influence prices, all relevant information is available to buyers and sellers, resources are freely employed in, in any So we assume that both buyers and sellers seek to maximize their gains from trading in perfectly competitive markets. So buyers maximize the satisfaction they obtain from exchanging their money for goods and services in markets, and sellers maximize the profits they earn from making goods and services available to consumers. When deciding how much of a good to purchase, buyers consider their own marginal private benefit, which is the dollar value placed on additional units of the good by individual consumers. Therefore, buyers maximize their gains from trading by adjusting the amount of any good they consume per month until the marginal profit benefit received is just equal to price. So price equal marginal private benefit equal marginal social benefit. While producers maximize their gains from trading each month when they maximize profits, the firm will increase profits whenever the revenue obtained from selling an additional unit exceeds the cost of producing and selling that extra unit. The marginal private cost of output is the cost incurred by sellers to make an additional unit of output available for sale. So the firm will maximize profits when it adjusts its output sold to the point at which price is equal to the marginal private cost of output. If marginal private cost exceeds price, the gains from trade would decline. It follows that producers maximize gains from trade at the point for which price equal marginal private cost equal marginal social cost. In a perfectly competitive market, both buyers and sellers maximize their net gains from trade at the level of output for which price equals marginal private benefit equals marginal private cost equals marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. So the question now is, when does market interaction fail to achieve efficiency? Inefficiency in competitive markets occurs when? When the basic problem that causes inefficiency in competitive markets is that prices do not always fully reflect marginal social benefits, costs of output, means other than markets needed to make social benefits of certain goods available. Failure of markets to make available certain goods, such as national defense, environmental protection, gives rise to demand for government production and regulation. Now, let's examine the impact of monopolistic power on the efficient allocation of resource. Monopolistic power occurs when a firm influences the price of a product. How? By reducing output to a level at which the price exceeds, exceeds marginal cost of production, causes failure of markets to result in inefficient levels of output. So, in figure 2.2, it explains loss in net benefits due to monopolistic power. We started by drawing the demand curve for monopolistic product reflects the marginal social benefit of possible levels of output. So, the demand curve reflects marginal social benefit. Then, the monopolistic marginal private costs reflect the value of all inputs used to produce additional output and therefore reflect marginal social costs. Now, the monopoly firm will produce output QM per month.
that is the monthly output corresponding to point A, at which marginal revenue equal marginal social cost. That's why the monopoly firm can achieve the maximum profit within monopoly conditions. When that much output is available per month, its price will be BM. That is the marginal social benefit of that monthly output, MSB for quantity M. Because a monopolist's marginal revenue is less than the price of the product, marginal social cost of production also will be less than the price. Thus, at a monthly output level of QM, price equal marginal social benefit, which are greater than marginal social cost. So, efficiency is not attained because marginal social benefit is greater than marginal social cost at quantity QM. And we know that to achieve efficient allocation of resources, marginal social benefit must equal marginal social cost. So, efficiency could be attained at monopoly market by forcing the monopolist to increase output until prices fell to a level equal to marginal social cost. The additional net benefits possible from increasing output from QM to Q star units per month are shown by the triangle area ABE. In figure 2.2, this represents the extra social benefits over the extra social costs involved in increasing monthly output up to the point at which marginal social benefit equal marginal social cost. That's why we can conclude that government intervention in the monopolistic market to increase output would be prescribed by normative economists seeking to attain efficiency. Now, let's examine other economic factors that could cause losses in efficiency in competitive markets, such as taxes. How taxes can cause losses in efficiency in competitive markets? When a product or a service is taxed, the amount that is traded is influenced by the tax paid per unit, as well as by the marginal social benefit and marginal social cost of the item. Therefore, the tax distorts decisions of market participants. In figure 2.3, we can explain the impact of taxes on efficiency. As the demand and supply curve for long distance telephone services, we assume that points on the demand curve reflect the marginal social benefit of any given number of message units and points on the supply curve reflect the marginal social cost of the service. The equilibrium output in the market corresponding to point E is 4 billion message units per month and the equilibrium price is 5 cents per message unit. The market output is efficient because it corresponds to the point at which the marginal social cost of long-distance telephone service is equal to its marginal social benefit. Now, suppose the government leaves a $0.02 per message unit tax on sellers of long-distance services. Sellers must now consider the fact that each time they supply a message unit, they must not only cover the marginal social cost of that unit, but also the $0.02 tax. The effect of the tax is to decrease the supply of the service as the price required by producers to expand service by one unit must equal to the sum of the marginal private cost of the service and the tax per unit of service. In figure 2.3, we can see that points on the new supply curve after the tax is imposed correspond to marginal private cost plus tax for any given quantity. And by logic, we know that the supply curve shifted into the left-hand side to explain the reduction in the supply due to imposing new taxes. As a result of tax induced 
decrease in supply the point of equilibrium now corresponding to point E dash. At that point, the price of telephone services has increased to 6 cents per message unit and the equilibrium output has fallen to 3 billion units per month. The final impact of imposing taxes within the competitive market is that the government will collect a total of $0.06 billion per month in tax revenue, which is equal to the $0.02 cent per unit tax multiplied by the $3 billion message units sold per month after the tax is imposed. The cost of the tax is not only the $0.06 billion per month paid by taxpayers, in addition, there is the loss in net benefits called excess burden of the tax equal to the area EE-P from telephone service that results from the distortion in the choices after the tax is imposed. When evaluating the marginal cost of new government program, we must add any loss in net benefits from distortions in market behavior to the dollar amount of additional tax revenue required to finance the program. Now, we turn to other economic factor which may cause a losses in efficiency, subsidies. Subsidies can cause losses in efficiency. Let's examine the effects of agricultural subsidies and the operation of agricultural markets. Suppose the government guarantees farmers a certain price for their crops. When the market price falls below the target price guaranteed by the government, the government will pay eligible farmers a subsidy equal to the difference between market price of the products and the target price. We can see the impact of subsidies on efficiency through figure 2.4, subsidies and efficiency. In figure 2.4, we illustrate how the target price program works and how it results in more than efficient output of the subsidized grains when the target price is above the market equilibrium price. The graph shows the supply and demand curves for wheat in a competitive market for this product. We assume that the points on the demand curve reflect the marginal social benefit of any given quantity. Similarly, points on the supply curve reflect the marginal social cost of any given quantity. In the absence of any government subsidies, suppose that the equilibrium price of wheat is $4. Per bushel, at that price, farmers produce Q-star bushels of wheat per year because that is the level of output at which price equals their marginal cost. This will be the efficient output level because it corresponds to the point E at which the marginal social benefit of wheat equals its marginal social cost. Now, let's see how the availability of the subsidy will affect farmers' decisions. Farmers know that they will receive a minimum of $5 per bushel of wheat. So, in their deciding how much to plant, they will base their decision on the target price rather than the market price. When they believe that the target price will exceed the market price, they are going to produce more and more and more of wheat. So, as shown in figure 2.4, they will produce QS bushels of wheat per year because that quantity corresponds to point A on the supply curve for wheat where the marginal cost of wheat is equal to $5. The output level QS is greater than the efficient output because the marginal social cost of wheat exceeds its marginal social benefit at point A. As a result of the target price program, more than the efficient amount of resources are devoted to the production of wheat. Therefore, the loss in net benefits from resource use is equal to the area EAC in the graph. In addition to this loss in net benefits, 
that results from the subsidy induced distortion in resource use, the target price program also costs the government $2 per bushel of wheat multiplied by the Q as bushels of wheat produced per year. The overproduction of wheat relative to the efficient level that results from the program depressed the market price of wheat to $3 per bushel, corresponding to the point C. On the time curve for wheat, the overproduction of wheat makes it seem cheaper than it would be without any subsidies. In fact, consumers end up paying only $3 per bushel of wheat, while the marginal cost of producing that wheat is for $5. The two dollars difference between the marginal cost to the producers and the price to consumers is paid by the government. So, to conclude, perfect competitive markets may cause losses in efficiency if it influenced by taxes or subsidies. That's why we say that not all government intervention within the market can achieve benefit to the market, such as monopoly markets. Why? Because in the perfect competitive markets, when government intervenes in these markets through taxes, through subsidies, it causes distortion within these markets. It causes inefficiency in allocation of resources. Thank you so much.